Alright, we are into our final section of the entire course. In section 6.4, working with Taylor series. Okay. Now we already know how to find the Taylor series for any function by doing the differentiation process. What we want to focus on now in this section is what can you do with those Taylor series. And it turns out that one of the things that is beneficial to most people is this. It's useful to recognize meaning you memorize the following Taylor series and they're actually Maclaurin series but I can use more generally the term Taylor series and that is this that if your function is 1 over 1 minus x this was actually the one the first power series we looked at x to the n and from 0 to infinity which converges on the interval from negative 1 to 1 okay that was simply the geometric series that gave us that that's useful to recognize okay most useful as we tried to emphasize in the previous section e to the x as your function is x to the n over n factorial which converges over the entire real number line. Okay. Also very useful the sine function negative 1 to the n x to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial, which also converges over the entire real number line. And of course the cosine function which also converges over the entire real number line. And finally the last one I'll give you the natural log of 1 plus x, meaning the natural log function shifted. We start at 1 because of the natural log's property of zeroing out. And that converges from negative 1 up to and including 1. Okay. Alright, so these can be useful to recognize and in fact I'm going to conclude the discussion of this section referring back to this idea a little bit in doing something the author doesn't do but I think is very worth doing okay all right but before we get to that final kicker let's take a look at uh, an example of how we can work with Taylor series and what that actually means and so the author actually gives you a presentation here of solving a particular differential equation and part of the reason I want to look at this is because it is a very nice simple differential equation to work, look at. The other part is I wanted to point out that the author did make a little typo and don't let that confuse you. This is Aries equation. At one point in the text the author refers to this as a y prime not a y double prime and another part he corrects himself and says y double prime I want to make sure you understand very clearly this is correct it's a second order differential equation for sure it is y double prime not y prime as he first states in the section okay all right so how do we work with a power series to help us here well let y be a power series. Okay, I don't know what the power series is, I just know it. I'm saying there is a power series representation to y. Can I now solve for what that power series is and therefore solve for y? Well, I would have to plug in. There's what I'm going to plug in for the y, right? 
What do I plug in for the Y double prime? Well, I've got to differentiate this thing to find out. Differentiate this, you get C1 plus 2C2X plus 3C3X squared plus 4C4X cubed, and on and on and on, right? And Y double prime, the thing we're going to be plugging in, is going to be the derivative of this. So 2C2 plus 3 times 2 C3X plus 4 times 3 C4X squared plus dot dot dot. Okay? And that's what I'm going to plug in to area the equation. So this goes in for the Y double prime. For the Y, this goes in. And since this is Y double prime minus XY is 0, that's the same as saying Y double prime equals XY, isn't it? So take your y double prime. And set it equal to x times the y. So think about taking an x and multiplying it here. You'd get a c naught x plus a c one x squared, a c two x cubed, and so on and so forth, right? And now let's equate these two power series. We know that in order for two power series to be equal, the coefficients have to be equal. So that means the constant on the left with no x has to equal the constant on the right with no x. But there is no constant on the right with no x. Therefore, that constant on the left with no, no x has to be equal to the 0, which means the value of C2 is 0. Okay. For C3, 3 times 2 times C3 has to be the coefficient C0. You just solved for C0, didn't you? Or you could think about it this way. You've solved for C3 in terms of C0. Okay. All right, let's see what else we can get out of this equating both sides. Let's see. 4 times 3 times C4 is going to be C1. So that means that C4, you can think of it as C1 has been solved for in terms of C4, or C4 has been solved for in terms of C1. And if you follow this pattern, think about it, the next one would be 5 times 4 times C5 would be equal to the C2, which means that C5 is C2 divided by 5 times 4. But remember what we determined about C2 is it's 0. C5 is just 0. What would be the next one? 6 times 5, C6, would be this coefficient of C3. So C6 is C3 divided by 6 times 5. But guess what? C3 is already known to be C0 divided by 3 times 2. So you have to divide by a 6, 5, and a 3, and a 2. And there's your C6. Okay, continuing the pattern, the coefficient 7 times 6 times C7 would be C4, which means C7 is C4 divided by 7 times 6. But C4 is C1 divided by 4 times 3. So there's C7 determined in terms of C1. And so you get everything in terms of either C0 or C1 if you continue this pattern. And that means you have found the power series. <coughs> the solution here is Y is C0, which we don't know, it's an arbitrary constant, plus C1, another arbitrary constant times X, plus, remember C2 was 0, 0x zero squared, plus C3, which we determined, remember C3, we determined was C0 over 3 times 2, plus C4, which is C1 over 4 times 3, times x cubed, plus C5, which is 0, times x to the 4, plus C6, which is C0, 6, 5, 3, 2, x to the 5th, 
plus C6. Sorry, C7, sorry, we're up to C1. 7, 6, 4, 3 times x to the 6, and on and on and on. Okay, and you have found the solution to this differential equation written as this power series. Okay. All right, so that's the typical use of power series in solving a problem. And of course, you can also do things such as integrate a power series and plug it in to something. Okay. All right, but what I want to conclude with is the following. Okay, note. We know the power series expansion for e to the x. And I'm writing a lot of terms here. Because I have to actually do something with it. Dot, 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 dot. Okay? And we know the power series expansion for sine of x. And we know the power series expansion for cosine of x. Okay. And when we look at these three things, we see something a little bit surprising. And that is embedded within the power series expansion for e to the x, we see the terms for sine x, x cubed over 3 factorial, x to the 5th over 5 factorial, x to the 7th over 7 factorial. Also we see the power terms for cosine of x. 1, x squared over 2 factorial, x to the 4th over 4 factorial, x to the 6th over 6 factorial, x to the 8th over 8 factorial. Alternating pattern here. In other words, I could take that e to the x and I could split it into two pieces. I could split it into the cosine part terms, right? 1, plus x squared over 2 factorial, plus x to the 4th over 4 factorial, x to the 6th over 6 factorial, plus x to the 8th over 8th factorial, plus dot dot dot, plus the terms that came from the sign. x plus x cubed over 3 factorial, plus x to the 5th over 5 factorial, plus x to the 7th over 7 factorial, plus dot dot dot. Okay. Now, we just rearranged the terms, right? When am I allowed to do that? When this is absolutely convergent, I'm allowed to do that. And this is absolutely convergent. So, <coughs> what benefit is that? Well, this really isn't here. This really isn't the cosine. The cosine has an alternating pattern to it. This isn't the sine. The sine has an alternating pattern to it. But it is pretty interesting, isn't it, that you have the same terms. It's just the alternating pattern isn't matching up. So is there a way to get that alternating pattern to occur? And yes, there is. How do I account for these things matching up with an alternating pattern occurring? And this is how we do it. Use I to make the connection. This is how I do that. What would e to the ix be? Well, e to the ix means I'm putting an ix in for each of these x's. And the same thing over here, an ix for the x's. And now think about that i. When you square that i, i squared is negative 1. 
you've got that alternating pattern. I to the fourth is positive one. I to the sixth is I squared times I to the fourth, so it's back to negative. I to the eighth is I to the fourth times I to the fourth, that's a one times a one. You got the positive, and look at that. You've got the alternating pattern of the cosine here. Same thing over here is our trick. I x. Here, I cubed is I squared times I. Well, I squared is a negative 1. I to the fifth is I to the fourth times I. So that's an I times a 1. I to the seventh is I to the fourth, which is 1, times an I squared, which is a negative 1, times an I. And look at what you got here. This right here is the cosine of x. What is this here? If you factor out the I, it's the sine of x. And so what we just discovered is e to the I x is the cosine of x plus I sine of x. And there's the connection between the world of trigonometry and the world of exponential growth and the exponential function. Okay. And so that's quite an interesting thing to realize, that not only can you really make all the trig functions out of cosines and sines, but you can make exponential functions out of cosines and sines very easily as well. There is a connection between the two. All right. <clears throat> now, one simple little result can be pointed out to you, and that is this. If we consider this as a function e to the i x, then we evaluate it at pi. That means you get cosine of pi plus i times sine of pi, right? Well, cosine of pi is negative 1 and sine of pi is 0. And that means, therefore, that we know that e to the i pi is negative 1. Or alternately, sometimes we write this, 1 is the negative of e to the i pi power. Which is a kind of an interesting result. Because it tells us the number 1, the most basic number we can think of, can be written in terms of this irrational number e, the imaginary number i, and this transcendental value pi all combined together to make one. All right, so this is not just a curiosity in mathematics. This actually gets used in further math courses. You use this in many different math courses coming up. You'll use it in differential equations. Um, you'll use it in complex number uh, uh, analysis. If you go on it to be a math major, it gets used quite a bit. So it is a fundamental result in mathematics, and that's a good place for us to stop. So as always, if you have any questions or concerns, don't hesitate to contact me. Be happy to do whatever I can to help, and good luck with your studies.